Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Murat. This is our 20th study in the book of Psalms. And we come today to Psalm number 57, verse 1. And Father, we ask your blessing on your word in Jesus' name. Amen. David writes, actually he prays in Psalm 57, verse 1, Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For in thee my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of thy wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. God is compared to a storm seller. And a storm seller does not get rid of the storm. But it does keep the storm from killing you. God may not get rid of all troubles, but he will keep those troubles from ruining your soul if you stick close to him spiritually. 2. I cry to God, Most High, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. Trusting God to the point where you have peace, even in the middle of chaos, requires believing that no matter how things turn out, God will fulfill his purposes for us. And it also requires being content with that. 3. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame those who trample upon me. God will send forth his steadfast love and his faithfulness. David expects help from heaven. He expects it. Those who focus on doing the will of heaven can expect help from heaven when they are in trouble. And David did. 4. I lie in the midst of lions. They greedily devour the sons of men. Their teeth are spears and arrows. Their tongues sharp swords. You know, David's crime was being a good man who was brave and did right and as a result was popular. That was his only crime and for that King Saul hated David and was determined to kill him. It was all about jealousy. Where there is jealousy there will be hatred. And with that hatred there will also be words that will cut like a sword and often things a lot worse than words. 5. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be over all the earth. David's prayer is, Lord, whatever happens to me, just make sure that you are exalted. David would love to be delivered. However, what he really wants is whatever will honor God the most. It is good to ask God for what we want. That's good. But it is also good to want whatever will honor God the most, whatever that may mean for us. 6. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. In other words, it backfired. It is very smart to listen to Jesus' words. He said, Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. That is a smart thing to give heed to because somehow God will do unto us as we have done unto others. 7. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. To be steadfast toward God is to dig in your heels and say, No matter what happens, it's you and me, Lord, all the way. I'm going to do what you want me to do, no matter what. I'm going to do. I'm going to do what you say, or I'm going to die trying. Eight. Awake, my soul. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. In other words, he says, I'm going to be worshiping God before the sun gets up. And you know, dedication to the worship of God is 
something that will help you to remain steadfast with him. 9. I will give thanks to thee, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to thee among the nations. For thy steadfast love is great to the heavens, thy faithfulness to the clouds. David may have been hiding from King Saul in a dirty cave, and he was, but his spirit was with God. See, when you get lost in the worship of God, any place you are becomes the throne room of the Lord. Praise causes us to sense God's presence, and that makes any place an okay place. 11. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be over all the earth. David is in a cave hiding like a hunted animal. But his prayer is for God to be honored. The key to having joy in a cave, the key to having joy in a hospital room, or in, in a lousy job, or whatever, is to be more concerned about God receiving glory than our own situation improving. Psalm 58 verse 1 Do you indeed decree what is right, you gods? Do you judge the sons of men uprightly? Now, when he addresses these gods with a little g, he's talking to corrupt politicians and other civil authorities. And he's saying, now, do you do what you're supposed to do? Do you do the job that you're supposed to do? Answer, verse 2, Nay, in your hearts you devise wrong. Your hands deal out violence on earth. They devised wrong in their hearts. In other words, these politicians, these authorities, exchanged justice for bribes. And they devised wrong in their hearts. And that's a dangerous thing to do. That is like priming a sinful, or a sinful, priming a sinful life. Devising wrong in your heart is like priming a sinful pump. Because it is a very small step from nursing sinful thoughts to doing sinful things. The Bible says, as a person thinks in his heart, so is he. 3. The wicked go astray from the womb, they err from their birth speaking lies. Now we are all sinners. And so in that sense we are all wicked. But there are clearly different degrees. Some people are worse than others. And God here in verse 3 speaks of those who are bad when they are little and they grow up to be evil and nothing seems to change them and they have no interest in changing. God could change them but they are full of self and full of evil and they want no part of a God who promotes anything good. 4. They have venom like the venom of a serpent like the deaf adder that stops its ear so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or of the cunning enchanter. Well, you can beat the hard-hearted or you can put them in prison and they still will not change. They do not care about what is good, and threats will not work with them. They are stubborn in their sin, and they stop their ears to any call to repentance. And God gives them a free will. They can choose to be that way. 6. O oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, O oh Lord. He's talking about these people who are hard-hearted in their sin. And they don't seem to have the capacity to do good, so he asks God to at least take away their ability to do evil to others. In other words, if they won't repent, then please stop them from hurting others at least. 7. Let them vanish like water that runs away, like grass. Let them be trodden down and wither. Let them be like the snail which dissolves into slime like the untimely birth that never sees the sun. Sooner than your pots can feel the heat of thorns, whether green or ablaze, may he sweep them away. Dry thorns were used as fuel for fast heat back in those days. If you wanted a quick, hot fire that wouldn't last long, you would use thorns. They would start up right away, they would burn fast, they would burn hot, sort of like the microwave 
of that day. And the point is this, God will kick up a storm of judgment fast and hot against the wicked who refuse to repent. 10. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Wow. Bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. God is using very strong language here. To remove any doubts about justice prevailing. To remove any doubts about wrong being punished and right being rewarded. 11. Men will say, Surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. Men will say that. Some people ask, Why does God allow evil to win? If he is a good God? Answer, Evil will not win. Oh, I know. Evil is ahead. I know that. But just remember, God has not been up to bat yet. And when the dust clears, and it is all over, good people will say it was worth it to play by God's rules. Psalm 59, verse 1. Deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who work evil, and save me from bloodthirsty men. God has not called his people to a passive indifference. He has called us to an active prayer life. Our prayers, combined with his power, produce defeat for evil and victory for good. Eventually, for sure. Verse 3. For lo, they lie in wait for my life. Fierce men band themselves against me. For no transgression or sin of mine, O Lord, for no fault of mine, they run and make ready. David says, I didn't do anything to deserve this bad treatment. And I don't know why, but he seems surprised. I don't know why, but Christians sometimes act surprised when those who do not care about God do not care about them either. Why are you surprised? Didn't Jesus say, If they hated me, they will hate you? If they persecuted me, they will persecute you? 5. Thou, Lord God of hosts, art God of Israel. Awake to punish all the nations. Spare none of those who treacherously plot evil. Some people say, A good God would not punish people. A good God would never punish sinners. Some people say that. You know how wrong that is? The good God does punish sinners who will not change, who will not confess. He does. And it is a good thing that He does, or the innocent would continue to suffer because of the things evil people would continue to do. What kind of God would allow evil people to go on and on and on and never punish them. Is that a good God? I don't think so. Because look how many innocent people would suffer. He is a God of justice. 6. Each evening they come back howling like dogs and prowling about the city. Now, put yourself in the situation back then because dogs were despised back in those days. They would roam around at night just scavenging for anything to eat. And if they couldn't find anything, they would sit down and they would howl out of disappointment. And notice David's enemies are compared to howling dogs. David's enemies were like dogs searching for him. because, But because God allowed David to slip away every time, they were like disappointed dogs howling. 7. There they are, bellowing with their mouths and snarling with their lips, for who they think will hear us. People who do not think that God hears them or watches them, and therefore they are not accountable to Him, will, no, will most likely be nothing but trouble for other people, and they're going to be in big trouble themselves. Because whether they believe it or not, God does hear, God does see, God does hold them accountable 
Verse 8. But thou, O Lord, dost laugh at them. Thou dost hold all the nations in derision. Some people who are extremely evil are also very intelligent, very skilled, and they are great schemers, and they use all of it to devise sin. And they think they're so smart. But God says that he laughs at them. He knows what they will do even before they, even before they think of doing it. He knows what they scheme even before they even begin to scheme it. And he will not overlook their sin. They are no match for God. Verse 9, O my strength, I will sing praises to thee, for thou, O God, art my fortress. When things are bad, and they do not seem to be getting better, remember, God can do anything he wants to do. If things are not getting any better, it is because God is not ready to let that happen for some reason. 10. My God, in his steadfast love, will meet me. My God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. He says, My God will meet me. To meet God includes having your focus on God, because believe me, if you're going to run into God, you're going to focus on Him. So, focus on God. Focus on your trouble as little as you can. Focus on God as much as you can. When we keep... I'm not to play make-believe that your trouble doesn't exist or, you know, ignore it in an irresponsible way, but to the degree that you are able, focus on your trouble as little as possible. Focus on God as much as you can. When we keep God in our minds, we are less likely to panic over bad things, which is a good thing, because that will keep us from doing foolish things and making a bad situation even worse. Now notice what David prays concerning Israel's enemies. Slay them not, lest my people forget. Make them totter by thy power, and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. Slay them not. Why would David say, don't destroy our enemies completely? Because a living enemy isn't the worst thing in the world. A living enemy, a real problem, actually is less of a spiritual threat to us than good times. Because good times often produces an indifferent attitude that lets its spiritual guard down because after all everything seems to be going so great. So there are worse things in the world than having a real enemy and a real problem because those things tend to keep us closer to God. 12. For the sin of their mouths, the words of their lips, let them be trapped in their pride. For the cursing and lies which they utter, consume them in wrath, consume them till they are no more, that men may know that God rules over Jacob to the ends of the earth. Sinners, blasphemers, whose filthy souls spill out in their ungodly words, will one day feel the wrath of Almighty God. And they will know that the Most High must be treated with reverence, and if he is not, there will be trouble. 14. Each evening they come back howling like dogs and prowling about the city. They roam about for food and growl if they do not get their fill. But I will sing of thy might. I will sing aloud of thy steadfast love in the morning. For thou hast been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. O my strength, I will sing praises to thee. For thou, O God, art my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. The picture here is David's enemies. It's a double picture, actually. And the first side is a, is a picture of David's enemies, the dogs, howling because of their failure. And then the flip side of this picture is David praising God for getting him through another day. Lesson. Enjoy victories from God in bite-sized pieces. Thank God for keeping you from sin today. Thank God for supplying your needs today. And then when tomorrow comes, you can thank him for that. Psalm 60, verse 1. O God, thou hast rejected us, broken our defenses. Thou hast been angry. O restore us. 
you have rejected us God to be rejected by God and feel it is bad to be rejected by God and not even feel it or care about it that is even worse consequently we should be grateful when God lets us know that our sins have grieved him at least then we can straighten things out 2 thou hast made the land to quake thou hast rent it open repair its breaches for it totters Israel was a mess King Saul was a demon possessed crackpot he even killed many priests he was hunting God's man David like an animal ungodly men were running the country and the Israelite army had just been defeated by the Philistines the country is falling apart it is splitting at its seams 3 thou hast made thy people suffer hard things thou hast given us wine to drink that made us real God you've done this to us none of the bad they experienced was by accident it was all designed by God for a purpose what that was I don't know but it was bad times will bring good results for God's people if they will just hang in there with God if it causes them to examine their conscience and if it causes them to repent of any sins they may be guilty of if it just if they just hang in there with God it will have good results long term for thou hast set up a banner for those who fear thee to rally to it from the bow a banner is a flag back then the bravest soldiers would carry their country's flag into battle they were bold to identify themselves with their country in front of the enemy and you know the enemy would go after that person who had the flag knock him down because that was a symbolic victory and so the bravest soldiers would carry their country's flag this verse is saying that that the more one fears God the more bold they will be the more one fears God the less they will fear man 5 that thy beloved may be delivered give victory by thy right hand and answer us that thy beloved would be delivered the holy remnant of people in Israel were loved by God and God actually did save that nation for the sake of a godly few even if it was Abraham Isaac and Jacob and their memory and God's promises to them he saved that nation he has kept it a nation for all these years for the sake of a godly few you know even one godly person can hold back a lot of trouble 6 God has spoken in his sanctuary with exaltation I will divide up Shechem and portion out the vale of Sukkoth when God speaks victory his voice prevails the voice of trouble is sometimes loud and sometimes disturbing but the voice of God is able to squash it if we pray verse 7 Gilead is mine Manasseh is mine Ephraim is my helmet Judah is my scepter God says that out of out of the Israelite tribe of Judah will come his scepter that's referring to the lawmaker and that is talking about Jesus Christ who came from the tribe of Judah he is God's lawmaker and man's authority ends when they try to command us to do something contrary to what God's lawgiver commands somebody commands you to act in a way that is unchristlike or to do something that he has forbidden in his word that's when you draw the line and say sorry I cannot obey you 8 Moab is my wash basin upon Edom I cast my shoe over Philistia I shout in triumph back then people poured water from a pitcher over their dirty feet but because remember people wore sandals and they walked everywhere so their feet really got dirty they come home they pour water over their dirty feet from a pitcher and then they would catch the dirty water in a wash basin God says Moab is my wash basin Moab was famous for enticing God's people to sin lesson those who would entice God's people to sin 
will be used by God as his wash basin. And I don't know exactly what that means, but I know it isn't good. 9. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Hast thou not rejected us, O God? Thou dost not go forth, O God, with our armies. O grant us help against the foe, for vain is the help of man. Vain is the help of man. God may use things, and he may use people to bless us. However, when we look to those things, when we look to those people instead of to God, we will learn that they are worthless without God's blessings. We ought to always look to God and recognize that he uses people and he uses things. But ultimately we must look to God. Man's help is useless if it doesn't have God's blessing. 12. With God, notice, we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. It is God. It is God who is behind all victories, all good things. But we must pray hard, and then we must work hard in order to be fruitful. Pray hard, and then do what you believe is best to the best.